And without it, if we don't build relationships that create dialogue, create deep meaning, and create transformation in our lives, those are the early steps. And there are institutional responses like now, today, like this synod, this church. And I'm really happy to be witnessing it. That's why I've been so moved for two days sitting over there, watching you, listening to you, observing you. Because for a person like me, who thought that nobody cared, here you are. And you don't have to be. You could live in your comfort zone and never be involved again. But you're all here. And you're all trying to find some way to manifest the love of God in your own lives, in our lives. And so that's one dimension of reconciliation that's important. This heart-to-heart -heart thing, looking each other in the eyeball, finding ways to do that more and more. And we'll get to the big issues later. There's lots of big issues. We've talked about it on the screen, some of those things. But if we don't change our perspective about each other, if we don't see ourselves differently, you and I, it wouldn't matter how many home runs we make of the big issues. If we don't learn really how to compassionately embrace each other, accept each other, and respect each other, that's the first, first step. So my magic wand would be, waving fast so we get over this phase so i'll go to the next question <laughs> <laughs> Gospel hymns. 
you know, it's, it's kind of peculiar. We start our rosary every day, uh, but, but my mother liked gospel hymns, and so I asked her about it, and she said, well, where that comes from? Well, she said, when I was a girl, uh, she said, uh, our family was Episcopalian uh, in the U.S. She said, when I was a girl, we would go to the Episcopal Church on the, on the first Sunday of the month. We went every Sunday, but the first Sunday of the month was a Sunday for communion. But she said, in those days, the Indians, that was the word they used then, she said the Indians weren't allowed to come into the church. So she said we had to stand on the steps. So she said I would stand with my mother and my grandmother. And uh, they would open the church door a little bit so we could hear what was going on inside. Because we couldn't take communion with the white people. She said the white people would take their communion when they left the church. Then the priest would open the side door back to the sacristy. And the Indians would go back there and the priest would give the communion at the sacristy door. But they went every Sunday because they were Episcopalians and they wanted to take their communion. She said one winter morning, they were standing on the steps, my mother, her mother, her grandmother, she said it was snowing and it was really cold and the snow was blowing around. And she said this nice white man came up to us and he said if you come to our church we'll let you come inside. He said we'll even let you sit in the front row. So they went with him, they didn't know who he was, they went with him and they went to this little Baptist church about a block away where they sang gospel hymns and got to sit in the front row. So three Sundays, my family would go to the Baptist church and sing gospel hymns, but the first Sunday of the month, which was Communion Sunday, they would all go and stand on the steps again uh, of the Episcopal Church because they wanted to take the communion, uh, and which is what Episcopalian should be doing. Um, so, so in my own life, I have seen and heard places when reconciliation wasn't at work which to me makes it all the more remarkable when you have an experience of people who actually come together. So let me ask each of our people at the table here, what's some experience you had when you didn't see reconciliation? When you saw something or you talked to someone uh, who was really broken by that contact or the event? Um, where it, it did happen, or even if we continued to make my working career with the government of Canada, it was, it was very, very much like that, where a lot of times it was very similar, where it, even when I worked for the government of Canada, and I was still lived in reserve, and it was, it was quite funny because here we are with the government of Canada fighting with the aboriginals in Nariel, working for both of them, or working for one, I'm, I'm following for another one. To, to, to the people kind of playing with. So it was big years where, where that uh, problem evolved. But I, I and my superiors and the government, we all kind of got like, well, we have no choice to get to tell this guy what's going on from both sides. So it was really weird how, how here I am, like I said, working with the government, and the government's not going to well be the originals. And I went home for a bunch of early days, and I listened to the stuff over here, and the stuff over here. So it, it wasn't working very well then, but it took many years for it to, to, to kind of evolve to even the point where it is today. And it, it's gotten better, but still, like everyone's got, it's got a way to go yet. Thank you. I think the uh, first time I realized and recognized that reconciliation was a uh, process even was uh, when I first went to work for what was then called the Indian Residential School Survivors Society in Vancouver. And because of the position that I held as executive director, I, became, I, I was invited to all the meetings, all the decision making, all, everything about this so-called Indian Residential School file I was invited to and the churches and the governments and we the survivors and our lawyers were fighting the harsh uh, hurtful um, combat with each other trying to figure out what is it that we're going to do about this uh, history of residential schools so finally um, I, I was also the co-chair of what was called the working caucus it was a national committee of those same parties and it was brought to our attention that we should have a set of national dialogues across the country where we could identify ways of the possibility of working together. How could we stay around the table 
when there was so much animosity and bitterness and harm, hurt, loss and darkness and anger, hatred. And what happened was we, we had seven dialogues across the country. The first one was very volatile and tense, intense. And people cursed and swore and pounded the tables, threatened each other. And we moved to the next city, Saskatoon, I think it was. And I, I observed that the tone of and degree of the conflict was starting to soften. And we moved across the country in those seven dialogues. Close to the end, my goodness, people were sharing stories, hugging each other. And we actually had some actual face-to-face -face forgiving of each other. And I said to myself, my goodness, there must be a way around this. If I've, what I've seen is true, it could happen on a larger scale, bringing people together all across the country and start sitting across the table from each other and getting to know each other better. But in these seven dialogues, what was helpful was that we identified, we knew how tough the job was, we identified some overarching principles that would guide us in all of our forward moving dialogues. So we all agreed, we signed off to it. And so whenever things got tough, we would go back to the overarching dialogues. And they were really straightforward, love, accountability, trans transparency, things we talk about uh, almost every day. But what was important about that was that we, all the parties, agreed we would be driven and motivated, motivated by these overarching pr principles that would keep us at the table until we began to start solving some issues uh, little by little. So from that moment on, I kind of kept sliding into this area of reconciliation, watching what was unfolding. Harry Potter had Hermione, and we are now joined by Jessica Salt, <laughs> who is from Seashot Nation. And I have to tell you, I don't know if you heard her coming, but I did. I did. And it's my mother's name. My mother's name was Sinam Maniwe, the sound a well-dressed woman's clothing makes when she walks. <laughs> so here she is, and she's going to tell us a little bit, first of all, about what you have seen with reconciliation, and then secondly, if you had a magic wand, what would you like to see next? Oh, do talk right into it. Okay. Um, I don't usually dress like this, but we did a performance at the Centennial Square for Orange Shooting. Um, and I just came straight from the performance. I, I feel really grateful today to be to see my my dear friend Bobby Joseph. I worked with him when I was uh, very young and uh, was uh, I was uh, acting out trauma a lot in those days. And uh, Bobby Joe, I, I went in and uh, I had to get some advice. I, my life was uh, spinning out of control and Bobby Joe didn't miss a beat. Oh, Bobby Joseph, sorry. And he didn't miss a beat and he, he looked me eye to eye and he helped me feel complete again. And I just want to thank you, Bob Joseph. You really helped me at that time in my life. And uh, it's, the, it's these people, it's these types of people that, that help us, uh, you know, overcome trauma that wasn't, wasn't ours to begin with. Uh, reconciliation, what do I see today? I see less racism, although there's still lots. I still go to the thrifties and I still get treated uh, less than, you know, and you can, you can see it, you can feel it. You know, I, I see um, reconciliation as, as uh, people wearing orange shirts today and uh, all of the discussions around residential schools and uh, it's a first step. The first step is putting on the t-shirt, the next step is what are you going to do? How are you going to support it? Uh, every year, is that t-shirt going to be put away in the drawer and forgotten? Or will you take, take our hands and say, what can we do? 
what can we do to, to help bring back, to bring back our language? Lorna Williams uh, told us, you know, you, we lay our language down on the land first so our ancestors can come to us. That's what I do and that's all the language I know. <clears throat> Will you help us rebuild our language? Will you help us re rebuild our, our song and dance again so that we can walk proudly, uh, you know, in, in complete? Will it be intentionally brought back like it was intentionally taken from us? How can you help us? You know, uh, Ruth the Hollander, she took the first step. She brought it upon herself to go to First Peoples Culture Council where I used to work. And she said, how can I help? And she started raising monies so that they could have mentor apprentice language programs in BC. And she's funded, uh, funded and sponsored a lot of those programs so that the language can start living again. You know, that we can uh, converse with uh, the old people and when we hear our old songs, we know what they're saying. We, I don't know what they're, I, I know many songs, I don't know what, uh, I sing the words, but I don't know what they mean. You know, I'm just learning, I'm 65 years old. And, uh, you know, so it, it's, um, it, my mother, it's been a, a, a long journey and, you know, I wish, if I had a magic wand, I wish I was 20 again. Um, not because, you know, of the, was the good old days, but, or I was in my prime. It was because the old people would still be walking today. And they, the old people that were fluent that used to come to our home. And, uh, and that they, that I would be so eager to learn what they had to offer me. And, and uh, you know, I, I, that I would learn my language. And I would learn what I'm singing when I sing the songs. Uh, I'd like to, uh, I would like to do a, a prayer for you today, and I'd like to, it, it, our people were such a praying people, you know, they, they didn't see that when they, they came in contact with us, because we didn't set one day aside, and, you know, or we didn't, you know, get on our knees and reverently, you know, uh, pray the way uh, some people pray. We prayed when we were chopping wood. You know, we prayed when we were going walking out onto the forest to get our, our cedar our cedar bark. We prayed to the trees, we prayed to the animals, we prayed to the medicine bushes. You know, we prayed when we got up, grateful for another day. We prayed when we went out to hunt the biggest whales, the biggest animals, the whales. Rituals, praying for days. We prayed alone in the, on our mountain tops. We prayed together as a people. And so the, there's many ways of praying, and today sometimes they, they'll ask an elder to come up.